No train driver wants to be cooked alive. That is kind of brilliant. Uh, for you. <laughs> that is a real idea. I think that's the first time you ever had one of them. <laughs> Shut up. You might be the first bastard to ever have half his brains eaten by a wolf and end up more intelligent. Both John Marson and Arthur Morgan are incredibly well-written characters. So well, in fact, that it's easy to forget, technically, we are playing horrible people. And the majority of us, I want to say at least 99% of us that have played both games, are more familiar with the story of Arthur Morgan, the man who was loyal to a fault, blindly listening to orders, doing whatever it took to satisfy Dutch and the gang's needs. Very rarely, I mean, he jokes about it, Hosea does as well, well, seemingly everyone around him, all like to poke fun of Arthur being this brute, this enforcer, someone that's just basically doing what he's told, and that is it. He's not a thinker. If that was the case, or even if he placed his own desires, wants, and needs in front of Dutch, the gang, or just his overall loyalty to both entities, then chances are he would have ran off with Mary Linton a long time ago. But obviously he didn't. That's not the story we get, that's not the Arthur we got, it's not the journey that we're taking through. We're taking down a path of someone that suffered for blind loyalty. And, in a glorious fall from grace and a desperate scramble to at least save as many people as he can, he tries to do as much good universally to at least feel better for himself. With the game being much newer, way more ambitious, and in some ways a lot more accessible than the original game, those are all factors that play into why so many people have played Red Dead Redemption 2 and have yet to play the original. Maybe one day we'll get a real proper remake of the first game, as I feel, you know, I think that game deserves that amount of love and attention, but for those that have never played the first game, what you're missing when it comes to John is he's almost an entirely different person. Now, of course, things change over time. People change, they grow up, they mature, or even they harden over time. Their priorities, their goals, the things that they're focused on and how they handle certain problems or situations may all change. That's just how we grow up and evolve with time and experience. The first game is set some time after the events of the second. John is much older, and I do have a couple videos coming out set to really compare and contrast Arthur to John in depth, so if you're interested in that or any other Red Dead content, please feel free to subscribe. But there's something that I mentioned in a previous video that I was even questioned for, and I found myself thinking this way again. So rather than just confining it to a video, I wanted to share it here and get everyone else's perspective on it, and then I can implement it into videos moving forward, make it more of a solid community thing. But what I said was, I felt John was much more brutal than Arthur. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Arthur's not brutal. He is. He's, as I said at the beginning of the video, he's loyal to a fault. He's got a one-track mind. There's nothing that he holds more closely to his heart than loyalty. If it wasn't for Dutch, if it wasn't for Hosea, or even the gang at large, whoever Arthur ends up with, it's a life and death type of situation. He will protect that person no matter what. And it seems like he would even do it to a capacity where if he gets a little bit more of a softer side from, say, Mary Linton, it wouldn't always result in violence. And what so many people miss from John in the first game is, similar to Arthur, he does have a one-track mind, but it's kind of different. You see, with Arthur, there's two things that I think separate him. The first one is Arthur's held accountable. He has to deal with other people no matter what, whether if he likes it or not, because there's still a gang he's got to go back to. And these other members of the gang are involved with their own little projects or plans or whatever that they have to make sure become successful in order to tell Dutch and everyone else that, hey, I'm earning my keep. A prime example is Sodom back to Gomorrah. Karen and Bill were planning on hitting the Valentine Bank. However, they couldn't do so because Arthur Dutch and John shot up the town of Valentine. So when Bill and Karen try to get Arthur to come on board, they have a little bit of a back and forth. And when it's pointed out that Arthur did his business in Valentine, Arthur says it wasn't his fault. And Bill points it out. Hey, whenever you fuck up, it's not your problem. It wasn't your mistake. But when he fucks up, everybody makes fun of him. We got something cooking you might be interested in. Am I gonna like the sound of this? Been cooking since Horseshoe. But you went and kicked up all that commotion in Valentine. Now, we was preparing to rob the bank there until you got involved in all that nonsense, and I don't know, I just feel like it's unfinished business. That wasn't my fault. It was just one of them things. How come every time I get in trouble, I'm called a fool and an idiot? But when you get in trouble, oh, it's just one of them things. <laughs> so it may not be dramatic or completely drastic, but there's still that element there. You gotta be careful, because while you may not 
be bringing massive problems to the gang at large or even Dutch, you could possibly be stepping on other people's toes and you may have to deal with the repercussions or confrontation from that. So he is held accountable. John does not have that. John's one goal is a safe return of his family. And because John is in this little isolated state of mind, the anger in the position that he's in, I think, makes it worse. And that's another element I think we can all understand. Have you ever been so angry that you just start brooding? Nobody talks to you. You're just sitting there left to think more and more about whatever pissed you off. And next thing you know, the next person you see, you're just mean mugging the hell out of them. You just don't want to talk to them. You know that the second they open their mouth, all the shit that's weighing on your shoulders is just going to be dumped on them. And in your mind, it's their fault. Leave me alone. With John, he's left alone. He doesn't have anybody on his shoulders. There's no accountability. The writers intentionally left him black and white. We don't really know where his morals, values, and really line is drawn. And a lot of John's biggest, let's say, atrocities were all committed in Mexico. If we can add a little bit to how I said he's isolated and he's left alone, keep in mind, when John went to Mexico, the way he was greeted probably pissed him off more. I mean, think about it. He's got to go to another country to hunt down one man that's not only one of the guys he's got to hunt down, but he's possibly harboring the other guy he was originally hunting this of course being Javier Escuela and Bill Williamson and as soon as John tries to cross the river he's getting shot at because the guy that's bringing him to the country a man simply known by Irish pissed off the locals so now John is left to deal with the relationship that Irish established on top of that Irish already pisses John off because he tried to betray him at least once or twice after John clears out the hostile locals he makes his way to a nearby village where three people try to rob him. Hold it, Gringo. I think you're forgetting something. A little taxation. <laughs> I have a large family. <laughs> I too have a family, friend. So that we may see our families again, I suggest we part ways amicably. <laughs> Can I see the boots, gringo? I think you can see them from where you're standing just fine, senor. Take off the boots, americano. All of this compounded by the fact that there's no one really for him to talk to, or even, as I said, Arthur had some type of accountability that was going to come back his way. John doesn't have that. John also has little care for anyone else besides his primary goal of his wife and son returning. This is something that Landon Ricketts, a gunslinger hiding out in Mexico, identifies and he even tells him, you can't be jumping on both sides of the fence because eventually you will get impaled. More enemies by the day. Perhaps you would know. Rumor has it you've been making all kinds of new friends. I don't pay much attention to just rumors. Just be careful, John. Keep jumping from one side of the fence to the other. You might just get impaled on it. I have to find these two men. With respect, how I do it is no concern of yours. Choose your tone wisely, partner. Remember who you're talking to. How could I ever forget? Who are you, John Marston? Apart from a rat feeding every other hand he can find, my name means something. And it's that conversation that kind of foreshadows what John ends up doing. Because at this point in time, Mexico's caught in the middle of a revolutionary war. John helps out both the rebels and the army. And it's during the missions where he helps out the army that he does some of the more messed up stuff that I was talking about. One mission in particular, John goes to help the army clear out a village that's known as a rebel hideout. After all the armed men are killed, the Mexican army rounds up the women that are hiding there and ships them back off to the colonel that runs the area. And then they order John to burn all the houses. John doesn't do it exactly enthusiastically, but he doesn't stop them either. He does exactly what he's told. I heard the little horse crying in that house over there. <laughs> Remember! Nobody takes them before Allende. We did all this just to get women for Allende? <laughs> no, that's just a bonus. This village is riddled with rebels. Make sure they don't have homes to come back to. There are fire bottles over there. Use them to burn down some of these houses. And what makes you think I'd do that? You want to find Javier Escuela, don't you? John, you're helping Mexico. Vámonos, muchachos! ¡Buen trabajo! So in this one mission, John stomps out rebels that are already repressed by the local government. He takes part in human trafficking by allowing those women to get shipped off to Colonel Allende, and then he burns all the houses down. And there's never a moment of guilt or remorse. You could argue John had the same mentality that he was going to go out the same way Arthur believed he was going to go out. The way of a gunslinger, or he saw his death coming, and so why flip the mentality now? 
these are people that he doesn't care about. These are people that are kind of just obstacles in his way. His main goal is his family. Who cares about anybody else? Maybe if John got sick, similar to Arthur, we might have seen a mentality flip, but it's because of the goal, really the way he goes about it as well, that I've always thought John is a little more brutal than Arthur. John does some honorable stuff as well. The things that he does for Bonnie and her ranch shows a different side of him. However, it's not really an emotional plea. It's more strictly out of repayment. Bonnie and her father did save his life, so the least he can do is save the horses from a burning barn or any little help around the ranch. The writing and the amount of material that we get from Arthur to John is vastly different. So, of course, we just have what we see in the game to go based off of. And that was just always my take. Just the things John did alone in Mexico brings to question how far are people really willing to go for their family, for their loved ones, for anybody or anything they hold valuable? And to what point can we sympathize and root for that side until morals and ethics of the situation become a bigger issue? And if we were to venture a little bit outside of just the narrative, John does also have a stranger's mission where you can threaten someone's wife or hogtie her and bring her back to her husband. I mean, technically you can pay him off too, but if it wasn't within John's character to do that, I don't think Rockstar would have left that as an option to do. So it kind of goes back to the one-track mind. Arthur upholds loyalty, and yes, he does some horrible shit. At least he's loyal, and that's what you can always count on. John seems to just have one goal in mind, and he's the Hellbringer. As long as that goal is achieved, then he's satisfied. But of course, that's just my take on it. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. If there's anything else you want to add to this conversation, Besides some Arthur and John videos coming out, I am going to be tackling some of their side characters from Eagle Flies, Rain's Fall, the German family that saved Arthur's life, and so on. So subscribe if any of that sounds interesting or if you're looking forward to anything. And like always, I'm taking suggestions or recommendations down in the comment sections. You can email me, join the Discord, or even follow me over on Patreon. But until next time, I'll see you all later. Mr. McFarland, I'm married. I have a son. I had a daughter, but she died. Years before that, I rode in a gang. We robbed banks, trains, held people ransom. We killed people we didn't like. Bill Williamson was in that gang. Now, if I don't capture my former brother-in-arms, great harm will befall my family. John Marston has easily become one of the most beloved characters in video game history. His betrayal in the original Red Dead Redemption game helped solidify his position as a man who lived a questionable life in his youth, running with a band of outlaws that were killing, robbing, and doing whatever it took to survive. And while the gang's leader, Dutch Vanderlyn, put everything they were doing in the context of fighting for what was right in a world that was cruel and unjust, as an attempt to make everything they were doing better or somehow less savage than what it was, the truth of the matter was, it wasn't. John in the first game did his absolute best to try to redeem himself from his past. Transgressions that unfortunately haunted him, that would continue to follow him, and ultimately would not let him live to see his son grow up. Red Dead Redemption 2, John is seen in a little bit of a different light. Especially since the game is put through the eyes of Arthur Morgan, his older adopted brother who had more loyalty to the gang and Dutch than anybody else. Because of this loyalty, because of this refusal of Arthur to think in any way outside of putting Dutch in the gang first, John is seen as slimy, someone who can't be trusted. He committed the ultimate sin and ran off for a little over a year without saying anything to anyone. And while John may not want to be the father of Jack, accepting him as his legitimate son, or officially claiming Abigail as his prized wife, those are separate things from running off from the gang. As Arthur says, we have a code, and he knows that. Running off on that kid is one thing, but there's a code. He knows that. He ain't Trelawney. Dutch and you pretty much raised him. I know, but it's done. Has been for a while now. Nobody else would have been welcomed back that easy after that long, and you know it. By all accounts, it appears John's return to the gang was one met with little opposition besides the rift between Arthur and John growing. Even with this sour view of John appearing to be less than trustworthy in Arthur's eyes, John still helps with the gang and looks out for what Dutch would want and how best to suit the gang's needs. This is apparent through John's initiative in setting up a train robbery during the missions pouring forth the oil and the sheep and the goats where he and Arthur steal some cattle off some ranchers and attempt to resell them at auction in Valentine. That is kind of brilliant. 
Uh, for you. <laughs> that is a real idea. I think that's the first time you ever had one of them. <laughs> Shut up. You might be the first bastard to ever have half his brains eaten by a wolf and end up more intelligent. What's worth pointing out as well is neither of these are shallow attempts to regain Dutch's favor or even try to rekindle their fractured relationship with Arthur. It's simply John doing his part, carrying his own weight, and trying to return to what it all was like before he left. But there is no obvious attempt of him trying to mask or hide from what he had done. He pretty much owns up to it. On the one hand, yes, he did choose to run off and escape the possible obligations he may have felt he had with Abigail and Jack. Perhaps it was as simple as not being ready for fatherhood, or maybe he was off looking to find himself, or maybe it was a mixture of the two. But personal crisis or not, it's clear he was still as loyal to Dutch and the gang, and was still all too willing to do his own part. I wanted to point this out because there's two sides to John the love and loyalty that he has to at least Dutch, and the other side, troubled by his own personal turmoil that can easily be muddled and misclassified as being disloyal or unable to be trusted. That is Arthur's view of him at the beginning of the game, and because that's Arthur's view, it becomes our view. However, it's crucial to recognize that there is in fact a difference, and that difference means if we were to really pinpoint the exact moment where John's perception and opinion of Dutch starts to change and the reason behind it differs entirely from the beginning of the game to the moment where we actually see John's mood begin to change towards Dutch. And John's mood is much more apparent than anyone else's. And there's even a direct occurrence that led to it, an occurrence that honestly, he never was able to recover from in terms of seeing Dutch the same as he did before. And that single event was the kidnapping of his son Jack. All throughout the missions, blood feuds, ancient and modern, and the Battle of Shady Bell, John's mentality is very different. He rants about how Dutch and Hosea went too far this time. There's always money, there's always something shiny, something new for these two con men to get their hands on, and this time, the two of them flew too close to the sun, getting Sean killed and Jack kidnapped. It's Dutch playing his games. Hosea too. Getting involved with those two families. Master con men working their magic. They thought there was a lot of gold. Yeah, they thought there was money. Ain't there always. Understandably, John is angry and in a panic, but we can't mistake this for anything other than what it is, and that's regret. John's words are nothing more than echoes of the pain and regret he has as a father, or lack of being one. No real attempts have actually been made to be a father to Jack, and John knows it. On the ride to Shady Bell with Arthur, John shares his doubts in Hosea, in Dutch, in their possible faulty memory, doubting if things were ever the way they remembered it to be. If they were ever the people they were meant to believe they were, he then continues to admit he rejected Jack as a son, who didn't choose this life, and is now paying for his father and adopted family's crimes. Abigail was also mistreated, and now, in this moment, John is realizing the weight of his actions, there are people counting on him, and he hasn't been as present as he should be. I treated Jack bad, Abigail too, I didn't want to believe he was mine. I believe John's obligations and dedication to Abigail and Jack became a real priority for him from this moment on. We can say Arthur's own shift away from Dutch was somewhat similar, albeit much later, and only when he was on his own deathbed. Arthur eventually became hellbent on saving as many people as he could, most notably John who had a family, a son, who could have something outside the life they all know. John's reality check technically wasn't as intense as being on the way out like Arthur's was, but Jack's disappearance and the fear of the unknown horrors that may be falling upon him was definitely one he needed, one Jack needed. What's also curious to me is how Arthur's response to all of this was. Up until now, Arthur made no reservations at telling John to just run off again. Why does he care if he went fishing with Jack when John says, it's not his son. Likewise, why would he care what happens to Jack? John, after all, has made the mistake of turning his back on the gang and refusing to father this young boy once before. Why is this any different? This could have very well been another chance for Arthur to just remind John of his past mistakes and to just leave yet again. The only difference now is John's words are now directed at Dutch and Hosea, something I would think would even be worse in Arthur's eyes. Yet Arthur doesn't do what he did in the past, he doesn't repeat the same sentiments, instead Arthur does the opposite. He reasons with John, tells him to not overthink the situation and descend into a rabbit hole filled with anger, doubt, worry, worry of what will happen to him his son, his wife. Arthur admitted before that he was upset with John for leaving, but he does say it in a way that betrays more hurt from a brother who chose wrong and was so quick to throw his family away 
rather than just someone who could turn their back and walk away from a fruitful past. Oh, well, if it's John's idea, it must be a good one. <laughs> what is it with you and him? Oh, uh, he disappeared on us for a while. When Jack was real young, a long while. A year ago. He did? And we was family, you know? Guess I still ain't fully forgiven him for that. Arthur never hated John. He probably never even wanted him to leave again either. All the anger, jokes made at John's expense, or constant reminders of his past mistakes are most likely just his own hurt being manifested in a way that would seem acceptable by everyone else. Best to hide hurt feelings behind broken loyalty after all. But back to John. In the moment, his words, everything he's saying is justified and amplified by his own personal regret. This was the eye-opener for him. In the beginning of the bank robbery in Saint Denis, John's doubt is voiced yet again, showing that even after Jack's rescue, John's mentality towards the gang, their current predicament, the situation, Dutch continuing to promise and never deliver is a mentality that he's only doubling down on. And this time, John voices his concerns with a bigger audience and even calls out Dutch directly. This is it, gentlemen. The last one. Where have we heard that before? What has happened to you, John? You lost all your heart. I'm just trying to stay real about all this. Real? Oh, how I detest that word. So devoid of imagination. The relationship between Dutch and John only gets more complicated from here, with John accusing Dutch of letting him get captured during the Saint Denis bank robbery, then Dutch implying to Arthur that John or even possibly Abigail may be the rat in the cave on Guarma. So what happened with John in that bank? He survived. Unlike dear Hosea and Lenny, the only one they took alive. Why is that, you think? I don't know. I was already on the roof. I didn't see it. And Abigail, I presume she was able to slip away in time. What are you talking about? You know, when I look back at all the chaos of the past few weeks, the apparent superficial chaos, I begin to wonder, maybe, for somebody, this is all going exactly to plan. Followed up by Dutch seemingly dragging his feet to save John from Sissica Penitentiary, and then leaving John to die at the end of the Beaver Hollow train robbery after John was shot, it's really a different topic to question if Dutch even still harbored any type of hard feelings towards John for ever leaving. Hosea does say it was gone, it was done and dealt with a long time ago. Arthur even says that Hosea and Dutch forgave John, but maybe deep down, he never did. It's possible. And the fact that John was so willing to call out Dutch in front of everybody questioning his leadership skills, all too aware of the current predicament that Dutch found himself in. Dutch may be narcissistic, he may be full of himself, he may be charismatic and a dreamer, but he's not an idiot. Accounting the losses all the way up until this point, and the fact that he was played for a fool by Angelo Bronte, and the Braithwaites and Greys tried to do the same, and now he's hearing a dissenter within his own ranks. Maybe it was this moment exactly where Dutch made up his mind that John really wasn't needed anymore. The potential rage Dutch felt in this moment towards John could have very well brought to the forefront of his mind that this man, this son of his had left before. He had turned his back on him and he'll do it again. John's belief that Dutch allowed him to get captured in Saint Denis, followed by Dutch's lack of enthusiasm of saving John, or Dutch's overall behavior during the chapter of Beaver Hollow, where he's starting to get closer and seemingly listen to more of Micah, isolating Arthur and John, and then of course it all compounded by John getting shot on the train with Dutch and Micah refusing to go back and save him, all made that original thought. The perspective of Dutch playing his games become all too real to John. That was the moment John became a doubter in his father. That was the moment John's priorities shifted. And for the first time, he owned up to all the wrong he did to Abigail and Jack out loud. Even if it was in the sense of extreme regret, because of the current situation that Jack was placed in, it was still a realization, the reality that he placed on his wife and son. Honestly, Jack's kidnapping may have caused a deeper rift in the gang than most of us ever even realized. What do you think? Do you think Jack's kidnapping played a pivotal role in changing John's mentality, or do you think that was something that was always in the back of his mind? Or it was really Saint Denis or any other event that, that caused the actual rift? I want to hear what you think down below. And of course, like always, if there's video ideas, suggestions, or, any or anything else you want to see, please feel free to share that stuff down below. But like always, thank you so much for watching, and to the next video, maybe check out any other theories or analysis that I may have. Angelo Bronte stands between us and our future. You'll damn us all.
Hosea Matthews, trusted assistant to Dutch Vanderlyn. Where Dutch is always seen as a charismatic and charming leader, Hosea was a realistic voice of reason, always cautious, always putting others' care and needs before anything else, before anyone else. Whenever Dutch had an idea, it was never acted upon until it was ran through the filter of Hosea. While the relationship between these two seems to have always been one of mutual love and respect, here in this moment, there's a rift between the two of them. We need to put him out of commission. I disagree. There's always an easier way. There ain't no easier way. Now, I know his type. He is a vindictive little power broker who rules by fear. Now, we pull that stunt. In his cesspit of a town, we're doomed. Arthur, if it's business, well, business is business. Angelo Bronte stands between us and our future. You'll damn us all. Dutch, with Arthur's backing, may have just decided on going through with a plan. A plan that may have indirectly fueled the course of events that will ultimately lead down the path of chaos destruction, and death of many people. One such person who would have to pay with his life is Hosea himself. It may be difficult to precisely say how things would have transpired differently had Hosea lived. Similar to the theory and the questions posed of what would have happened if Arthur never contracted tuberculosis? Or, if he still did, what would be the outcome if the sickness was slow and he found himself in better health during the events of Beaver Hollow? Today, we're going to be tackling two questions. The first one, of course, is what would have happened if Hosea had lived until the dying days of the Vanderlyn gang. The second, though somewhat closely related question is, how much differently would the robbery of the Saint-Denis bank have gone down if Dutch and Arthur heeded Hosea's warning here and decided to just leave Angelo Bronte alone? Let's begin with that question right there. While there's no evidence that the raid on Angelo Bronte's mansion and subsequent death had no direct impact on the events of the bank robbery on the surface, one could easily put together it set into motion a series of events that put the Vanderlyn gang under a bigger microscope than they needed to be. In a previous video, we already touched on how powerful of a man Angelo Bronte was, even if we just talked about it briefly. Bronte's sudden disappearance and obvious murder, given the absolute bloodbath left behind in his mansion, would have put many law enforcement officers on high alert, least of all the the Pinkertons, who had been closely gaining in on the Vanderlyn gang. Twice now, Agent Milton and Ross had appeared close by and even inside the Vanderlyn camp, an unwelcomed arrival that definitely contributed to the Vanderlyn gang relocating up in Shady Bell. With the Vanderlyn gang's trail turning cold yet aware that there's still within the general area, events such as a failed trolley station robbery, a shootout on the ferry boat in the harbor of Saint Denis, and finally the massacre of Bronte's estate would clearly point the Pinkertons in the right direction Dutch was moving in. Given Bronte's known to have the local law in his own pockets and seen in the epilogue mission bare knuckle friendships, the city and all those immediately under Bronte's control still felt his absence. An absence that definitely led to an increased awareness within the city of Dutch in the gang's movements. While there's no glaringly obvious evidence on the Pinkertons contacting Angelo Bronte directly or even trying to communicate with Bronte's men or law enforcement within the city to get an idea of where the Vanderlyn gang is, we can assume to some degree Bronte's position and relationship with the Pinkertons. Seeing Bronte's sense of superiority over the Vanderlyn gang, the politicians that on the outside actually run the city of Saint Denis, such as the mayor, or even the outcasts like that of the Indians. No one is allowed to conduct any type of business within this city without his knowledge or blessing. I believe this feeling would be the same towards even the Pinkertons, especially if Bronte saw use of the Vanderlyn gang, which he did, as during the mission The Gilded Cage, Bronte suggests having Dutch kill people for him in the future. That is Hector Fellows, mm. the self-righteous newspaper man. Maybe, maybe you will kill him for me one day. <laughs> With Bronte running the city, whether if he's seen a usefulness to be had out of the Vanderlyn gang or not, the bottom line here is due to his heightened sense of superiority and the fact law enforcement along with his heavily armed bodyguards were all under his control, there would be no need for the Pinkertons' help to be sought out with neutralizing the threat that is the Vanderlyn gang. Why would Bronte need any sort of help dealing with some inbred backwards country folk? After all, it was because of him that Dutch and his members are even still breathing within his city. When we look at it from this perspective, it's almost as if Bronte is actually the buffer Dutch needed from the Pinkertons. There is no need for the Pinkertons to come guns blazing into the city that's already under control by local official law enforcement that's further supported by Bronte's personal militia. If the Pinkertons were to do that, then they run the risk of pissing off Bronte. And by pissing off Bronte, they run the risk of the Pinkertons and Bronte's men, backed up by local law enforcement, engaging in an all-out war. A war that would be perfect for Dutch to escape in the background of. Better than 
after the Pinkertons to just continue to patrol the local area on the outskirts of Saint Denis, defend Leviticus Cornwall's property while keeping a keen ear on any kind of reports indicating the Vanderlyn gang's presence within the area. Within this context, by Dutch and Arthur ignoring Hosea's plight to just leave Angelo Bronte alone, the insult of being tricked into robbing an empty trolley station was, by Hosea's standards, an insult that can be easily forgiven, as Bronte is not only too powerful, but Dutch is also taking the insult way too personally, putting everyone at risk. I believe if Dutch and Arthur listened to Hosea and allowed Bronte to be as is, Bronte would have acted one of two ways. Either he was fearful of a possible effort of retaliation by the Vanderlyn gang, which in turn would lead him to doubling his personal security at his mansion, or aware of Dutch's survival through the failed trolley robbery and his intentions to acquire as much cash as possible to move on would have doubled the amount of police presence around the bank, hopefully as a deterrent. Considering there was no heightened security at Bronte's house though, when Dutch did finally seek his revenge, we can say the first option really is impossible. I was thinking maybe the security here just wasn't heightened because Bronte hadn't yet heard Dutch was still alive, but I find that very unlikely given how tight of a hold this man has on the city. Someone had to have already informed him of Dutch's survival. He has to be aware that Dutch is still alive. With that being the case, a lack of increased security would just prove to be another sign of this man's arrogance and firm belief that he really is untouchable. And even if he did heighten the security surrounding the Saint Denis Bank, well it would have been a little bit more difficult and, and the Vanderlyn gang's approach to actually taking on this bank probably would have been altered significantly. I think even if the plans changed drastically, there still wasn't a chance of Hosea being captured. However, with the disappearance of Bronte, the floodgates were now lifted, and the Pinkertons, all too aware of how the Vanderlyn gang collectively and individually operated, saw a chance to snatch a sole member who was tasked with the role of a distraction. It was just by pure dumb luck that this sole member was Dutch's voice of reason. I think it was due to Bronte being gone and the gang's heightened sense of being untouchable, a feeling undoubtedly given after the murder of the most powerful man within the city was carried out with almost no repercussions whatsoever that put the gang in this vulnerable position. If Bronte had been allowed to live, I believe Hosea would have also lived. Which is an interesting way to really think about the relationship between Dutch, Bronte, and the impact that it ultimately had on the robbery of the Bank of Saint Denis. I think this had one of the most detrimental repercussions possible that no one ultimately saw coming. If those ties between the Pinkertons and Bronte can really be believed to be in this context. Now, if Hosea was to see the end of the Vanderlyn gang, what would he see and what role would he take up? Truthfully, I don't think he would take any other role besides one that sounds a little bit disappointing for the most of us. While I believe there isn't a shadow of a doubt that if Hosea had been allowed to live and he's seen the events of Beaver Hollow really unfold, I think Arthur would have had one of the strongest support systems that he really badly needed during this chapter. Hosea still would have been his consul. Hosea still would have been that voice of reason. And trying to hold Dutch accountable while also keeping the gang together wouldn't have fell firmly on Arthur's shoulders as much as it feels like it does in the actual game. But as I was saying, I think Hosea would still take a little bit of a disappointing stance because if we take a step back and look at how his interactions with Dutch became as the game progresses, Dutch, whether if we want to attribute this to Micah or not, slowly started to do as he pleased, pushing Hosea to the wayside. As early as a robbery in Leviticus Corner Wall's train during the chapter of Coulter, Hosea is already against this idea. He just wants to lay low, he just wants to get out of the mountains, and he still wants to ensure everybody is safe and isn't constantly moving from point A to point B with the Pickerton's hot on her tail. Dutch, however, obviously feels strongly against this. Even from this early moment in the game, Dutch mentions on their way to Horseshoe Overlook that Arthur and Hosea can reminisce on the good old days and discuss how Dutch has lost his mind. If Hosea had lived during the dying days of the gang, I think this is exactly how it would have played out. Hosea now more than ever would be hell-bent on saving as many people as he could, saving them from the burning ship that Dutch was now the captain of. If Hosea didn't jump ship and leave on his own volition as so many others did, I think he and Arthur in a twisted way would still be very loyal and devoted to Dutch. He may be psychotic, madman leading them all down to ruin, yet he's still their loved companion and father. I believe they would try to reason with him as Arthur tried to reason with him during the events of the actual game. Considering Hosea is more of a pacifist versus Dutch, I don't think Hosea would have been as aggressive with it. I do think there would have been a strong possibility of a type of civil war erupting where instead of it being Arthur and John versus Dutch Micah and the rest of the gang members, it definitely would have been Arthur, John, and Hosea. 
It would just now depend on how many people actually respected and backed up Hosea versus Dutch. But I'm going to pass this question on to you. What do you think about this theory? Do you think it's feasible? Do you think it would have been highly unlikely and there's something else that you to actually be the case? Let me know down in the comment section below. And of course, like always, if you have any theories, character analysis, or anything like that that you want to have us to jump into within these next videos, by all means, please feel free to share that down in the comment section below. But until then, thank you so much for watching. Why are we doing this? Weather's breaking. We could leave. I, I thought we was lying low. Yeah. Come on. What do you want from me, Hosea? I just don't want any more folks to die, Dutch. We're living, Hosea. We're living. Look at me. We're living. Even you. But we need money. Everything we have is in Blackwater. You fancy heading back there? No. Listen, Dutch, I ain't trying to undermine you. I just... I just want to stick to the plan, which was to lie low, then head back out west. Now... Suddenly, we're about to rob a train. What if Dutch was killed during the failed ferry job back in Blackwater? And what if, as a result of Dutch's untimely demise, Hosea had to take charge of the Vanderlyn gang, a gang that may well have been known as the Matthews gang from that point forward, as many gangs took the names of their leaders at that time, something that's apparent through the names of the Vanderlyn gang, the Adriscolls, and even the Buller twins as some examples. Or, a better question is, would there even still be a gang to refer to? This is going to be an interesting what if video, especially for me, because if I can be honest, when I was originally asked how Hosea could be the leader, or at least the sole leader of the gang, I thought Hosea would not really be capable of it. Now hear me out. The reason why I thought that was because I was just comparing Hosea's position to that of Dutch's, and the different styles in leadership and approach to trying to get the gang out of a bad situation. I made the mistake of taking Hosea's approach of lying low and conning versus outright robbing as being weak and incapable of demanding enough respect from all of the Vanderlyn gang members to really hope that the gang would stay together. I also had the mistake of thinking that Hosea didn't have a brutal side to him, making it possible for the gang to ultimately be walked over if it wasn't for Arthur ensuring that that would not happen. But was I wrong? And it shows how little I pay attention to the story sometimes because there's moments where Hosea's shown an aggressive side to him. I think the most notable one is when the gang attacks Braithwaite Manor. Hosea's the one basically all up in Catherine Braithwaite's face. Sure, Dutch pulls out his gun and even is the one that slams her against the wall, but Hosea does not shy away from questioning her, demanding answers, and has a demeanor basically telling her that everything that's happened within the last five to ten minutes, all your sons dying and your mansion on fire is all because of your mistake. As he says, boys are off limits, and now your entire bloodline is paying for that. I never liked you. Why'd you take the boy, Mrs. Braithwaite? You stole boys my Boys are liquor. off limits. You stole my horses. Ain't no rules in war, mister. Matthews. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> Where's the boy? I'm in the middle of another playthrough of this game, and I pointed this out in a recent video, but for the first time ever, I caught a camp interaction where Hosea stands up, draws his pistol incredibly fast, and pulls it out on Bill, who was annoying the shit out of him, and he threatens him to just leave him alone. So that also shows that he's not timid, shy, or even unwilling to defend himself towards people that could be considered friendly, people that are fighting for the same morals, values, or even his own subordinates as himself. With just these two instances, and the fact that we already know that Hosea is one of the original founding members of the Vanderlyn gang, on top of he's respected, he's wise, he does have his own great leadership skills, although a little different from that of Dutch, he is capable of being a loved, respected, and compassionate leader, all too willing to be brutal and aggressive whenever the time demands it. One other thing before we jump into what I think would happen, there's something we need to set straight. Characters such as Sean, and maybe to a degree Trelawney as well, may not even be an equation to this theory. This theory is reliant on the gang going up to the mountains after the Blackwater Massacre had taken place, an event that resulted in a massive law enforcement force possibly supported by the presence of many Pinkerton agents chasing after the gang. And it was in an effort to shake the law they went into hiding up in the mountains. Now I believe this was Dutch's decision with him thinking it'd be easy to evade capture 
by being covered by the harsh weather conditions. Which means that if this was Dutch's decision, and Dutch in this theory is meant to die in Blackwater, the gang would never have went up into the mountains to begin with. However, if we were to give this the benefit of the doubt and say this was a collective decision and not just Dutch's, and we say they still went up into the mountains, the events that would definitely not happen is the gang's decision to both assault the Adriscoll camp up here and take the plans of robbing Leviticus Cornwall's train off of the Adriscolls, and this would remove two major pressures off the gang's back, which may have also made it easier for them all to slip away into obscurity. But the first one is the Vanderlyn gang and the Adriscoll's rivalry stemmed from a personal vendetta of both Colm and Dutch. With Dutch gone, even if Colm and his gang continued to honor the rivalry, the assault here wouldn't have taken place as it was Dutch's own idea to do so under the claim that Colm was up here for them. Are you sure about this, Dutch? Yes. Both been through a lot recently. We hardly back on our feet yet. And the last thing we need is to get bushwhacked by Colm O'Driscoll. Let's go. I know you hate him, Dutch. He's here for us. I doubt that. No, nope, you're just doubting me. The second pressure is, with the train robbery never taking place, or at least not committed by the Vanderlyn gang, Cornwall wouldn't put such a massive price on the head of Dutch, which may have resulted in the gang being a lower priority on at least the Pinkerton's wanted list. If the gang wasn't able to slip into relative obscurity and just disappear, then with the lack of funding or added pressure from Cornwall wanting some type of revenge, the breathing room and leisure needed to properly plan out an escape to the virgin lands of the west may have come into fruition a lot cleaner than any of us could have thought possible. Sure, the gang may still commit some cons or small robbing here and there within Valentine. The switch in leadership from Dutch to Hosea may not be so insane that people like Bill or even Arthur really would refrain from bullying the locals, and Strauss would definitely continue looking for prospects at least, but out here in Valentine or not, I think the main goal would be moving back out west in the opposite direction. This is what Jose is constantly bringing up to Dutch's attention after all. As the game progresses, he reminds Dutch they're getting further and further from where they wanted to go. This is even said as early as Coulter. Covered our tracks, so now we wait a bit, and we go back to Blackwater, and we get our money, or we get some more money, and we keep heading west. But we're heading east. For now. For now. We got this. We're safe. This appears to be Hosea's primary objective, and I think he would do whatever he could to get the woman, Jack, and all the members with him who chose to come with him to this land as safely as possible. I think the priority would be trying to keep the entire gang together within the initial shock of Dutch's death, which is another thing that we gotta take into account. If Dutch was to die in Blackwater, how would that impact the gang? Through the events of the game itself, we see how a massive death such as Hosea's impacts the rest of the gang members. I mean, it's a little muffled considering everything that happens immediately afterwards. Dutch goes more and more off the rails. He becomes much more ambitious in who he picks fights with and how he decides to initiate those fights. He manipulates the Indians. He starts a fight with the army. The gang gets stranded out in Guarma. Arthur's diagnosed with tuberculosis. There's so much going on that there's not proper time to reflect on the death of Hosea. Given all the recent events, it becomes almost like self-preservation for everybody else. The downtime to reflect on the passing of Hosea and the impact of him being gone isn't given to us. If Dutch was to pass away during Blackwater, I think that downtime would have happened a lot sooner. All the characters and the gang's overall position, I think would allow them to have that downtime to reflect on how big of a character and inspiration and motivation Dutch was as a figure and what they're fighting for and what they're actually doing. I think coupled with Dutch's death and Hosea's own mentality, which is a mentality we see more towards Clemens point where Hosea drops little tidbits of how he wishes things were different. Maybe he regrets not leaving this life behind, not coming back and living his final days with Bessie somewhere else. Considering this interaction that he has with John, where he basically tells John to stop being dumb, he's got a wife, he's got a family, take him and leave. <coughs> Good morning, Arthur. The thing is, John, the thing is we all gotta die. I know that. I, of all people, know that. Excuse me? We all gotta die, but you got the chance to live. Not just to live, to live for love. 
I got no goddamn clue what you're on about, Hosea. You're not as dumb as you act, John Marston. I don't understand. Be a man, John. It would suit you. I think ultimately that would have been Hosea's stance. If Dutch was to pass away in Blackwater, I think his priority would be to get all the gang members together, move out west, get everyone together, and say, hey, the writing is on the wall. Our time has passed. If you want to stay with me, by all means, feel free to do so. For protection, maybe because you just don't want to be alone, for some type of help or guidance, I doubt Arthur would even leave Hosea, so I think he would definitely stay by his side. But I doubt Hosea would claw and beg everyone to stay. I think he would try to reason with each and every single member, make them reflect and think about what they have, what they don't have, what they need, what they're looking for, and then tell them. You know, if you want to go, I wish you the best. I can help you, set you up, but this life is not long for any of us anymore. It's a mentality that's very similar to what Arthur does towards the end of the game, where he allows people to jump ship and leave him and leave Dutch, where he sees the fertility of trying to hang on to something that doesn't exist anymore. But I think that is what would happen if Dutch had died and Blackwater, and if Hosea was to take the reins from that point forward. Now, I really didn't mention Micah because I think one of two things would happen. Either Micah would die in Blackwater as well, or Hosea and Arthur would definitely blame Micah for everything that happened, ban him from the gang, or put him out to pasture and deal with him themselves. I think if Dutch wasn't around, Micah would be a much less of a nuisance and nowhere near as big of a problem. He may still try to kiss ass, but ultimately, with Dutch being dead and the gang trying to drop this lifestyle and causing more of a ruckus and problems for themselves, Micah would have no choice but to be dealt with and either sent on his way or put six feet under. But that is my take on what would happen if Dutch had died during Blackwater and Hosea took the reins from that point forward. Let me know what you think. If there's anything else you want to add to this theory or maybe I missed something, by all means, please feel free to share that down below. And if there's any other theories, conspiracies, or characters you want to see me cover in the future, Please share that. But like always, my name is Cynic. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you all in the next video. Who am I kidding? One of O'Driscoll's boys couldn't open his mouth, but he'd tell a lie. Screw it. Let's just have some fun. Huh? Geld him. Yeah! What's he doing? Where's he going? Oh, don't worry. You're only balls, boy. Just gonna cause trouble. You know, in Imperial Rome, Eunix was among the happiest and most loyal of courtiers. Oh, no, you kidding me, right? Of course. You sick bastard! So, oh, what do you want from me? Very few characters have found themselves in such a disheartening position as Kieran Duffy. A man whose very origins of falling in with Vanderlyn gang sealed his position as someone who couldn't be trusted. Someone who was weak, a fool, and a Driscoll. No matter how hard he tried, taking care of chores around the camp and tending to the horses, no matter whose life he decided to save or how badly he stuck his own neck out on the line for the rest of the gang, no matter how badly Kieran tried to reason with all those around him, he still was not one of them. In some way, it's hard to think if he would ever be considered anything other than what he was continually referred to as an O'Driscoll. I think for him to really be accepted by all, and I mean accepted in a way where he's respected and not referred to as anything other than his own name, or maybe even talked to in a manner that is similar to how Bill is, where Bill is still a member, just his effectiveness is questionable in some areas. How come every time I get in trouble, I'm called a fool and an idiot? But when you get in trouble, oh, it's just one of them things. <laughs> but Kieran is kind. He's soft-spoken and quite nervous. In order for him to adequately escape the Driscoll moniker, he would have to prove himself to be of far more use than just tending around to the camp. And maybe that price would mean actually bringing in Colm straight to Dutch or continuing to provide more and more valuable information on the gang he previously rode with, allowing the Vanderlyn gang the pleasure of, if not immediately taking care of Colm himself, then continuously ripping off score after score, getting under Colm's skin and even systematically destabilizing the Adriscoe's power and influence in the local area. But unfortunately, that's not the case at all. Neither way, personally speaking, if it wasn't for Arthur getting sick and Arthur's own mentality and perspective starting to change because of his sickness and him having to come to terms with his own mortality, I don't think Karen would have ever properly been accepted in at least Arthur's eyes. 
I think it would only be through Detch's direct blessing that would influence Arthur to lower his guard and give Kieran a fair shot. And even then, I think Kieran would have the same amount of trust as Micah, as far as Arthur's concerned. But of course, that is if Detch would ever give that blessing himself. Who really knows? Detch's own position towards Kieran, I found to always be a little interesting as well. I mean, if we take a step back and look at Kieran's position, he would be the ideal recruit for Detch after all. A lost, vulnerable soul that technically is at the mercy of his rival. I mean, the first time we see him, he's being smacked left and right by Calm. Understandably, when Kieran is captured, he is a little screamish and all too eager to denounce the Adriscals that he's writing with. But ultimately, after time has passed, I think even by looking at him, you can tell how useful he is. There's no point in continuing to have that level of hate or disdain towards Kieran. He's not that much of an effective gunman, and it's pretty clear that he's not even a highly trusted member within the O'Driscoll camp. So as far as information comes, he would obviously keep hitting a brick wall similar to what he does within the game. It would be up to him to take up arms and try to be a much more aggressive gunman, although taking a deep look at his personality, or not even a deep look, just looking at how he speaks and how he interacts around those he comes into contact with, it's simply not within his character. But I want to go back to Dutch real quick. Time and again as the story goes on, Dutch displays the ability to at least play the gracious host and feign submission. We are simple country folk. All we have is each other. You have nothing to do with destroying the liquor business. We was innocent bystanders. And that which we weren't innocent of, well, we, we most surely were ignorant of. That was a route he could have definitely taken with Kieran. Combe had to inform the men who chose to ride with him about this rival gang that they would undoubtedly continue to keep clashing with and with the explanation of who this gang was, has to come some information on the gang's leader. Dutch betrays Combe and his men in the worst light imaginable. Realistically speaking, Combe must be doing the same. So by feigning hospitality and appreciation, Dutch could have very well caught Kieran by surprise. With this notable contrast in character from what Combe told him and the rest of the O'Driscolls who and what Dutch was, the 180 may have lowered Kieran's own guard in a very different way, with Dutch approaching as a benevolent leader, a surrogate father, if you will. We obviously don't know this until much later after spending more time with Kieran, but I think it would be a fair argument to raise that if Dutch decided to do so, that of course would have ran the risk of Kieran running back to the Adriscals and betraying the Vanderlyn gang by basically telling Colm where the gang was hiding out at, you know, the gang that basically just cleared out their entire camp of their explosives, of their map, and of all their men. But either way, we know Dutch doesn't do any of this. Instead, he resorts to threatening and even being all too willing to torture Kieran simply by his affiliation with his hated rival. How Dutch decides to treat Kieran, I think, can just be seen as an extension of Dutch's own hate and unwillingness to see anything shy of Combs' suffering. A suffering Dutch was all too willing to let run wild on Kieran in the meantime. In the grand scheme of things, while Kieran is only in a handful of missions, it's hard to really believe how much he could contribute to the gang, given his own personal quiet nervous demeanor tending to the horses and quietly doing his part to ensure the gang's survival seemed like it was something he was much more comfortable with than going out and securing big scores. Hell, even Lenny appeared much more aggressive and hardened than he did. But despite this, I do think because of Kieran's own demeanor and not really appearing in all that many missions, Rockstar gives the intentional impact he's left to have. It's a life troubled and plagued by loneliness, by punishment, by never being accepted. Maybe it was because of this fear of being left alone and dying by himself that ultimately drives him. Kieran said himself, he wasn't given a choice to even ride with the O'Driscolls. He was given the offer to ride with them or die. And while he chose with the former, refusing to kill or plunder as the rest of them did, may have found him in a position where he was the bottom of the barrel, weak spineless, only interested in looking after the horses. This refusal to bring in cash or actively spread the influence of the Adriscals, or even properly stand up for himself. This meant similarly he was in a position in the Andriscoll gang as he was with the Vanderlyn gang, which he openly says to Arthur, Bill, and John on their way to Six Point Cabin, albeit he says this revelation in a manner that is meant more to try to get the three of them to understand a common ground between both of the gangs rather than depict himself as an abused victim, something even John took an offense to. You know, you all ain't that different from the old Driscolls. What did you just say? I've been watching you all these weeks, and, uh... You've been tied to a tree. You don't know nothing about this gang. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say you don't know much about the old Driscolls. But maybe I know more about you than you know about them. And I know all about them, so... It's an attempt to make them realize he's human too, while attempting to alleviate the mutual hatred 
a hatred that he possibly understood the Vanderlyn gang may be the more logical out of the two. But regardless of intent, Kieran's position in the gangs he finds himself in and the grand events of Red Dead Redemption 2's story as a whole is one he possibly never would have gotten out of, a position he depressedly shares with Arthur on their fishing trip. After Kieran made the decision to bring Dutch's men to Combs' doorstep at Six Point Cabin, whether if he wanted to pick sides or not, this action inevitably sealed his fate with the Vanderlyn gang. He cannot leave the comfort of the campgrounds without some type of escort, some type of protection from Combs' men that are roaming the heartlands. See? Look at this. I ain't so bad. At least you ain't tied to a tree. I'm still a prisoner, Arthur. I can't step outside camp by myself for a second without being terrified of one of Combs boys gonna come pick me up. When I'm in camp, I got Bill and Sadie whispering in my ear all the time how they're gonna kill me in my sleep. It's like living in a nightmare. And within this protection from Combs' men, he cannot find peace from his protectors, since he constantly has Sadie and Bill in his ears all too eager to share with him what they'll do to him in his sleep, or Dutch constantly reminding him that he can't trust this previous traitor. It's torture. The optional fishing mission with him during the chapter of Clement's Point is one I recommend giving a, a shot because it provides a lot of insight for Kieran, with him acknowledging his own unique circumstances and Arthur even refusing to find any sympathy for this man who he says he may have ended up killing a six-point cat or any other future run-in with Combs' men had events been different. Honestly, in the end, Kieran's loyalty from one gang to the other will be doubtful. With him revealing Six Point Cabin to Dutch under threat of torture and him revealing Shady Bell to Comb under the same circumstance, although I suppose everyone has a breaking point. However, given his willingness to stand shoulder to shoulder with other Vanderlyn members when Milton and Ross visited the camp, something even Micah isn't seen doing, you have to at least give him credit for trying to earn his place when the gang needed him most, especially if it meant putting his life on the line which he did, being butchered and humiliated in the worst way imaginable. And it's kind of sad to say for me, but my first playthrough, technically my first two, I didn't even realize who Kieran was when he died. I had a oh damn moment, but I just didn't remember what person that was. And hearing how all the Vanderlyn members talk of Kieran after he passes, it's unfortunate to say, but maybe that's what he was really meant to be known for. Not the person he was, not what he did, not how hard he tried or how pure his heart was, but the manner in which he died, which is kind of sad when you think about it. How would a Red Dead Redemption spin-off game work? Would a spin-off game even work? And if so, what would you want to see from a spin-off game? These are just a few basic questions that come to my mind when the idea of a spin-off game is brought up for the Red Dead Redemption series. And I get it, for some, the idea of a spin-off game won't work because the series is so huge, and what the games try to do with their protagonists is too massive. Or there's watching them go from questionable, morally bankrupt people and slowly over the course of that game's events, trying to do what they feel is right for the people they ultimately care about. It may be too late for them to be saved, but at least they can do something in the hopes of trying to save others. That is arguably the ultimate essence of these games after all. Now don't get me wrong, these are fantastic games that are really centered around one person and their own individual battles, and that is not a bad thing, nor is it something that is done wrong or portrayed poorly. I think it's anything but that. Many of us can sympathize with both Arthur and John, identifying what means the most to them, the things that motivate them, what they cherish, and how they go about getting their own individual goals accomplished in order to ensure the most desirable outcome for them comes to fruition. The first Red Dead Redemption game had so much going on within its own world. Mysteries that people can go out and discover on their own by just exploring the world and interacting with the world's NPCs. There's also places people and gangs that are placed directly in front of the player throughout that game's narrative. Characters John has to help in order for their services to continue. Services he needs in order to rescue his family. That game's primary goal. Arthur in the world of Red Dead Redemption 2 does something very similar. Now across both games there are many different people with interesting backgrounds or characters that have, at least on the sidelines, grown and evolved into people that they were never even close to being from the start of that game's story. For instance, with Red Dead Redemption 2, Sadie had to be one of the characters that has the most notable transformation from start to finish. We watched Sadie begin hiding from the O'Driscolls who took over her ranch and killed her husband. There was a high likelihood she too would end up dead beside her husband, Jake, if it wasn't for the Vanderlyn gang saving her. Sadie descended into a depressed, traumatized state only to slowly emerge as this rage-filled woman 
all too eager to embrace her new life as an outlaw. Okay, here we are. So, what's the plan? I shoot the shopkeeper while you- No, are you insane? I thought we was outlaws. A lifestyle she was all too willing to unleash on regular folk as she slowly accepts the gang as her new family, and this, her new identity. And in the epilogue, she becomes a terrifying and highly skilled bounty hunter. Charles Smith was once a wanderer, going from gang to gang until he finally fell in with the Vanderlyn gang, a few months before the events of Red Dead Redemption 2. Although he doesn't seem to have that much interest in the gang's politics, he does have some form of allegiance to it, or at the very least has some kind of hope with Dutch's philosophy, even though he can see straight through the bullshit, acknowledging no matter how eloquently you put it, this life, this type of work and way of living isn't one of glory and honor. Charles originally comes off somewhat aloof. Early on, we are shown he has his own beliefs and values, so he's not a hollow character or one that lacks any sort of allegiance. I mean, he's actually depicted pretty well, even in the beginning. He comes off as someone that just treats the gang as another one that he's fell into and helps and can expect some form of protection. For me, what I can recall off the top of my head that changes for Charles specifically is during Beaver Hollow. Charles begins to get heavily involved with the local Wapiti tribe, trying to give counsel to Rainsfall, attempting to keep Eagle Flies out of trouble, and in the end, even helps the entire tribe pack up and move on. He becomes heavily involved with them, and unlike his affiliation with the Vanderland gang, it feels more like a decision out of personal connection originating in their mutual heritage. Charles could very well have regrets and could always have wanted to be part of a native tribe, and here with the Wipedes, he may have finally found that, with it gaining a closer connection to his mother, who was Native American herself. I specifically call out Sadie and Charles because those are the two most requested characters by the player base to continue with the next game, along with Jack Marson, of course, and what happens after the events of the original Red Dead Redemption. Personally speaking, I don't care to continue Jack's story. You can feel however you want about that. I'm just saying for me personally, unless Jack ventures into Mexico or another country or area where the law and civilization is slow to take hold, then we may be moving a little too modern for my personal taste. I'd rather the next game explore the golden era of the Wild West, move further back in time rather than closer to the future. But that's just my stance on it. Sadie and Charles could also be explored, of course, as far as where they ended up and what they do after the epilogue of Red Dead Redemption 2. Charles heads to Canada, and Sadie, I believe, continues her career as a bounty hunter. I think a small spin-off game would do well to continue their own character arcs and wrap up the events and characters of Red Dead Redemption 2 much nicer. But above all else, I think what a spin-off game could really bring to the table that will benefit everyone in all the games is much more officially established lore within the Red Dead universe, giving us a bigger and much more detailed look at this world the game takes place in. Hell, there's so many different ideas I've heard for spin-off games that could work, ranging from how Bill Williamson established his own gang and set up in Fort Mercer in the original Red Dead Redemption, which would bridge from Red Dead Redemption 2 to the first game a lot better. Or playing as Davey or Matt Callender, giving us another peek into what the Vanderlyn gang was like before Red Dead Redemption 2. With that game ending as Dutch and Michael was preparing for the Blackwater Massacre, this would still leave what happened during that event a giant mystery. But it would still give us an insight of how Davey, Mac, and Jenny were, as well as how exactly Micah joined the gang and the way the members originally accepted or possibly rejected him. Assuming everyone knew Micah just saved Dutch's life, they had to have accepted him graciously in the beginning. And to watch that change from them all accepting him, being overtly grateful for saving Dutch's life, and possibly even seeing a little bit of remorse and guilt from Arthur for not being there, and having this stranger ultimately have to save his dad or his father, to then only watch it all fall apart throughout Red Dead Redemption 2 would be incredibly interesting. It would definitely add more to the relationship between Micah and Arthur. Let's take that a step further. What about flipping the entire concept on its head? Micah is considered to be the most hated character in the entire game of Red Dead Redemption 2. However, if you look at Micah objectively, now I'm not saying he's a good man nor justifying his actions. I've just pointed out in some videos before that most of our hatred stems from Arthur's own dislike towards Micah. Arthur technically is not a good guy himself. The only thing really separating Micah from Arthur is Arthur has a sense of morality and does seem to hold regret. He also appears to refuse to kill children. Micah 
has no standards. Micah also lacks the one thing Arthur cherishes so much, loyalty. Micah is the epitome of self-preservation. It is what he strives for and he cares little for what the price of it is. I ain't the bad guy you think I am, Arthur, but I am a survivor. Stick with me and you'll live. Honestly, can you imagine how a spinoff of a game where you play as Micah would be? I think that would be stupidly fun. It might even humanize Micah a little bit, but technically if the game is framed where Micah's the lowest of the low, killing, robbing, and enjoying the thrill of it all while caring little for who ends up on the receiving end of it, and then his redemption is the moment he saves Dutch's life in that bar, it will work within how the series already does it. Beginning with a man who's indiscriminately destroying the lives of others, doing whatever he pleases, and at the end having a change of heart. Maybe we could possibly see the gangs Micah ran with before and the jobs he was a part of, possibly showing him being the cause of other gangs disintegration similar to what we've seen with the Vandalin gang. And at the end, him running into Dutch and ultimately saving his life was the start of a new beginning for him. A new gang, a new leader, a new found purpose as Dutch would be the first person Micah would ever actually save. Or we could revisit what I said before, how Bill founded his gang from Red Dead Redemption 2 to the first game, bridging them together, and Javier is a little more of a less developed character than Bill, I feel. Maybe we can see him return to Mexico, and what he got up between Red Dead Redemption 1 and 2 as well, which would develop him a lot more, and I think that would make a lot of people happy, me particularly. Javier is one of those characters that I wish was always present, but I have moments where I do like him and then I have moments where I fucking hate him. But he is still a character Rockstar can use. There's benefits to using already established characters. With them serving as the vessels for the next story, there isn't as much time that has to be dedicated to explaining who they are and what exactly is going on, allowing more time and resources to go into furthering what has already been established. The cons to it is be possibly retconning and negating information that has already been established, but on the flip side, if a new character is used, time would have to be devoted to establishing them and their existence in the world that they're in at this point in time. There's also got to be connections tied to this game and this character to the other games and the other characters that exist, but there wouldn't be any chance of disrupting facts and information already set within the game's world. So pros and cons to everything. At the end of the day, a spin-off game, a Red Dead game before the next real Red Dead game, can work. There's almost an infinite amount of material to pull from, and it doesn't have to be so grand. Technically, we already got a spin-off game in the form of the Undead Nightmare before. Obviously, it wasn't canon story-wise, but there was some gameplay additions, and it was just more Red Dead without being a Red Dead game. I'm not asking for another Undead Nightmare, although I definitely won't complain. I'm just saying, with Red Dead Redemption 2 going more narrative-focused than the third possibly doing the same, it would be nice to get these little DLC expansion packs or even full-blown quote-unquote spin-off games that add more to the overall story, the overall world, everything going on. Because so far between the two games we do have, there is a universe and there are games that are present in both games. And personally speaking, I would love to hear the origins, the ongoings, and the aftermath of what happened to those gangs from a different perspective that isn't just from Arthur or John, or whoever the third protagonist is in the next game. But that's just my thought on the topic. What do you think? Would you love to see another Red Dead Redemption spinoff? Would you even buy this spinoff? If you had a chance, would you use a pre-existing character or someone entirely new? From the Bowler Twins gangs, the Skinner Brothers, the Del Lobos, or even the O'Driscolls? Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Like always, thank you so much for watching, and if you haven't, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button. I try to post Red Dead content every single day. Matter of fact, I just put out a video on what if Hosea was the leader of the Vanderland gang and Dutch died in Blackwater just the other day? Enemy hideouts are strongholds. Campfires found out in the open or ambushes waiting for you. There's so much out in the open frontier of Red Dead Redemption 2, yet it still feels tamed and like a neutered experience. Well, you can clear out hideouts that are playable in the main stories, such as clearing out the O'Driscolls at Six Point Cabin, or Hanging Dog Ranch, or even taking out the Lemoyne Raiders at the mansion of Shady Bell. The sheer offering of enemy hideouts to overtake, or even the frequency of being caught in the open world by such enemies is surprisingly few. There are six gang hideouts total in Red Dead Redemption 2, with some of them being quote-unquote replayable, and by that, they're only repopulated if they're tied to a main story mission, such as Six Point Cabin. However, outside of them being tied to the mission, once cleared, that's it. They're never able to be redone again, 
again, the camp you took over is never attacked again by a group of vengeful members of the gang you took the area from. There isn't a second wave of enemies or anything like any of this. Nothing. That's it. And in a way, it's disappointing that the main Vanderlyn camp never gets attacked itself. I get that may sound a little odd, but with one of the game's core pillars being showing how different the Vanderlyn gang is different from other gangs in the area, I think a randomized attack by roaming a Driscoll's or a group that secretly followed a member from town back to camp would have leaned more into the rough lifestyle that the gang is subjected to. Because you can go out and cause all this mayhem in Valentine or get ambushed by some of Driscoll's not even too far from camp, kill them all, let a couple witnesses go, and then a few moments later just stroll back into camp like there's nothing wrong. For me, it breaks a little bit of the immersion because you know no matter what, venturing into camp, you're safe. But minus the immersion, I think, in a game centered around the well-being of the Vanderlyn gang and promoting unity, I think it definitely would have benefited greatly to see moments like that happen. They're vulnerable just like everybody else. And obviously hindsight is 2020, but after multiple playthroughs, I still find it harder and harder to believe no one whether that be calm and the vast numbers of men in his ranks sprawled all over the state setting up traps ambushes attacking officers that are transporting his men or extorting the residents of valentine had not managed to at least get a bare idea of where dutch is potentially hiding out imagine how much more differently you would have thought about certain actions if you knew just outside of town if you were being ambushed by a driscoll's at gunpoint that if you were to massacre all of them the following night there'd be a bigger presence followed by multiple patrols of a driscoll's in the area only for you to continue killing them and then the entire area starts crawling more and more with the driscoll's that are vengeful for the lives that you've been taking all the nights previously and with each more massacre and the increased presence of the driscoll's you're putting the camp more and more in jeopardy. It would have felt like there was much more repercussions to killing other gang members out in the open world. And with it, the other gangs being much more active and capable. I get it, the whole premise is the Vanderlyn gang is much more skilled. The whole point of it is being quality over quantity, the polar opposite from Colm and the Adriscals. But at times, it's easy to feel like a lot of it is just fodder. No one really puts up that much of a fight. But minus the other gangs, on the flip side of this, you do have the question of the Pinkertons, Cornwall, and ultimately Milton. In the multiple times Milton and Ross turn up around or inside of the Vanderlyn camp, you would think with the Pinkertons being employed directly by Cornwall, a man who is extremely vindictive, and as the game progresses, continues to apply more and more pressure on Milton for his lack of progress with apprehending Dutch Vanderlyn, something that's apparent towards the end of the game, where you actually see Milton and Cornwall ending a meeting. You've spent a considerable fortune with your agency, and still nothing. This Vanderlyn robs me and laughs at me. I asked for the best. I paid for the best. We are very close, Mr. Cornwall. I know you've heard this before. Can't, sir. Send a telegram to Goldberg in New York. Tell him I won't borrow it more than 3.2%. Sorry, no, I have heard it before. And get that army man to pay his portage charge. Yes, sir. We are doing all we can within the confines of the law. The law? I think we both know what you can do with your law. Find me Dutch Vanderlyn. Bring him here and leave the laws to them as need them. Good day, sir. For me, it's hard to believe that Cornwall wasn't able to get a location out of Milton or Milton out of annoyance with how much pressure Cornwall was putting on him, just decided to say forget it and give up the location of the Vanderlyn gang. But I guess that's ultimately just a different argument. For the sake of it, you can't just say that the Vanderlyn gang was never attacked out of reasons for the story to make much more sense. Because if so, the two times where the gang is attacked would have been a lot less meaningful. And those two times being when the Adriscals assaulted Shady Bell, when they discovered the location of that gang hiding out after the torturing and killing of Kieran, and then of course at the end of the game during the chapter of Beaver Hollow when the Pinkertons finally discovered where the gang is hiding out in. Although personally, I don't really count that because the gang ultimately has already fallen apart. Six gang hideouts have always seemed a little trivial, especially without them being repopulated. I never understood why there's so little and they aren't able to be done multiple times. Rockstar's already dabbled with gang wars before, the most famous of which was possibly in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, where you have to clear out a neighborhood or block ran by a rival gang. Once taken over, rival gang members that once patrolled the streets are now replaced with members that flew York colors. I don't expect a portion of the map that's ran or rather harassed by Adriscoles or Lemoyne Raiders to be replaced by Vanderlyn members, since the Vanderlyn gang, by contrast, doesn't really operate by the same MO to just blatantly harass anybody, nor do they have the numbers of the Adriscoles or Lemoyne Raiders, but a feature such as this would have felt much more appropriate for this type of game. Even if the world of Red Dead Redemption 2, where it's meant to symbolize a time where outlaws are long gone 
and consequently gangs are much more rare i think they would have been able to sacrifice that narrative portion to cater a little bit more towards gameplay or even then they could have made it more hand in hand whereas from Sandini onward we kind of see the Vanderlyn gang really deteriorate and the story accelerate in terms of recklessness and the noose of love ever tightening around the gang's metaphorical neck they could have did that with the same thing as the gang hideouts earlier in the story they could have made it much more abundant they could have been repopulated and able to be redone yet yet as the story progresses the number of which starts to drop drastically by contrast something that has always confused me and felt a little backwards is committing a crime and being seen by a witness and then having the loss and out in you can all happen in the blink of an eye. Sometimes it happens so fast that the witness system reflects more of a 21st century telephone system than a system in the 19th century that is purely based on word of mouth. The pinpoint accuracy in which officers or even bounty hunters descend on you in your location is sometimes unbelievable. I made sure Assad the is an exception since there is an officer on seemingly every corner, so it wouldn't be too difficult or far-fetched for one to hear someone shouting for help. Yet in a small cattle town like Valentine, or especially the remoteness of Emerald Ranch, should not see you running away from law enforcement or a group of bounty hunters in just a minute or so of committing the crime. Moving into a future Red Dead Redemption title, I think it would be great for Rockstar to implement different kinds of varieties of the wanted system in, and in particular towns or areas that are remote from cities such as San Denis or bigger towns of Valentine's size have their own forms of vigilantes and militias to defend themselves and when you do generate some type of wanted level for yourself or notoriety they stay confined within that area or within that particular town and it doesn't become a statewide issue it may sound as if i'm getting off topic but i feel they're somewhat related rockstar went heavy on a wanted system that was more centralized and robust than what i feel the game should have had more of or even as i was saying with the hideouts they could have made it tied to the narrative where the beginning of the game it wasn't so centralized it wasn't so robust gang hideouts were much more abundant and then as the story progressed and it felt like the law was starting to have a stronger hold on this part of the country then the wanted system would then become much more robust the likelihood of being stopped or robbed out in the open world or running across gang hideouts would minimize and drop off drastically and i think that approach would have been the most satisfying because it approaches it from the narrative standpoint and it also approaches it from a gameplay standpoint where it would make sense why there's so many gang hideouts or lack thereof yet there's such a strong police presence when you commit specific crimes in certain areas it would have also played a lot more into the outlaw fantasy that i feel that this game at times is a little lacking of you know but that's just my opinion let me know what you think down in the comment section below what's your take on the gang hideouts or even the centralized wanted system in red dead redemption 2 how would you want that stuff to change in future red dead titles let's talk down in the comment section below and if you're new here maybe consider subscribing for some more red dead redemption content or technically rockstar themed content in general you got any friends as bounty hunters none that spring to mind black bell wanted outlaw hiding out in cane break manor Black Bell's an intriguing figure in Red Dead Redemption. If we were to go off the Red Dead Redemption wiki, it's claimed she's amassed a bounty on her head higher than that of famous gunslinger Landon Ricketts. While we can't confirm or concretely deny this, what is certain is she's laying low, trying to find a small moment of relief. That is until Arthur brings a group of bounty hunters straight to her. You got any friends as bounty hunters? None that spring to mind. Well then you done led them boys here and you none the wiser. You want that Wild West story, don't you? Yes, I do. All right. Get up here quick. Now when I give you the word, hit that. Whole place is wired. I always found it a little unfortunate that our time with the Black Bell is so short. Arthur is only given a small amount of time with her, fighting off wave after wave of bounty hunters, proving he is no friend of theirs, all while hearing her call out enemy movements and comment on the increasing bounty on her head after dropping all of these hunters. There's gonna be some price on me when all this is done. The price don't matter. I always found it interesting that a Gatling gun was brought out to handle her. Given the large amount of manpower and ordinance for a single woman, it wouldn't be too bad to say maybe her accumulating a bounty that much higher than Landon Ricketts isn't so far-fetched after all. Clearly she's dangerous and highly intelligent since she already had a planned method of defense and ultimately escape. This is apparent by her bags being pre-packed and dynamite all rigged up around her cabin. Intelligent, highly dangerous, and not entirely reckless. It's obvious Black Bell's in her middle age. If she's the same age as Calloway, Billy Midnight, or Emmett Granger, men who are all way past their prime and notice older than Arthur. You used to be a quick draw guy. You knew Jim Boy Calloway? Used to be correct. 
then there's a long over. Bell, at the very least, has adopted an air of caution, an air that's probably only been heightened as the years have progressed and she's gotten older in age. While the exchange between her and Arthur is released so that way Arthur can get a story on Calloway, this being the one and sole exchange between the two of them is kind of a missed opportunity. While Red Dead Redemption 2 by itself is a very large and expansive game, I always felt like it was a missed opportunity for Rockstar to be able to implement any type of decision making. While I get it, that'd be too massive and too complex to implement that type of system into Red Dead Redemption, and what I mean by that is having a system where you can kill off essential characters or make decisions that have an actual impact on their overall story. But that could be venturing a little too much into RPG territory there. But in contrast to all the other characters that we hunt down for the Callaway quote, Black Bell's the only one that seems useful. She's the only one actually willing to sit down and talk with Arthur, even though it is an exchange for him to defend the hell that he brought to her doorstep, and she's the only one that seems still competent enough to actually defend herself. She doesn't fall into the deep alcoholic depression that we see Billy Midnight in, or the rageful arrogance that we see Flacco Hernandez in, or Emmett Granger, jealous of Calloway actually being the center of attention. Black Bell seems to be the only person that actually genuinely lived that gunslinger lifestyle and instead of rejecting it instead of wallowing on decisions that she's made in the past instead she continues to live day by day accepting the consequences and repercussions of the life that she chose to lead in her early adult years it would have been nice to see rockstar give arthur the ability to recruit people outside the main story considering he basically is within the top three most respected members of the vanderlyn gang he's definitely within his right to do so or i believe any member ultimately could have done so if they expressed that they were basically just exercising Duchess teachings, but it would have also been nice to see Rockstar establish sideline stories dependent on your own interactions with people and where your honor was. While it's an intriguing thought to explore of what would have happened if Black Bell was invited to join the Vanderlyn gang, or what position she would have taken up if any at all, should she have accepted the invitation, at the very least seeing her story further explored in the game would have been great. Similar to how we've seen, you know, Edith Downs descending into chaos, witnessing the death of her husband, only to then sell herself in the streets of Saint Denis and later to be helped out by Arthur, remorseful of the role he played in exactly where her life is in today. Or even if we saw something on a much smaller scale. Similar to that of The Curse of True Love, where he helped Bo and Penelope escape the town of Rhodes. They could have easily had it where somewhere down the road, later on in the story, we accidentally run into Black Bell and she's being chased by bounty hunters and you can help her one last time. You know, just any other extra interaction with her. Because the short amount of time that we had with her was very reminiscent of anything you would have with Micah or even Sadie. Where you just know anything involving this character, there's going to be a bloodbath. You're going to have to have a stockpile of ammunition. All your weapons need to be cleaned, greased up, and ready to go because this is not going to be easy. Of all the storylines, especially particularly when tied to Jim Boy Calloway, Black Bell is the one that has always stood out because it's frankly the most interesting to me all the other ones you basically kill has been quote-unquote gunslingers whether if that was the reality or not black bell is a real representation of what you would believe to be a gunslinger in the middle age living a life on the run we don't duel her we don't kill her yet the interaction with her and the exchange between her and arthur was always one that stuck with me and it's just unfortunate that she didn't pop up at least one more time in the game even in the epilogue as john or john commenting on what happened to her through a story given through jack anyways let me know what you think down in the comment section below this video was actually inspired i guess by this comment that i saw on why dutch didn't take advantage of city and it just kind of had me thinking but like always thank you so much for watching if there's a character analysis a theory or anything else you want me to touch on feel free to share that down in the comment section below but until the next video thank you so much for watching